the plan. <clears throat> the head of the army and the head of the Air Force stood at attention beside the Queen's breakfast table. Sophie was still in her seat, and the BFG was still perched up on his, or sorry, was still high up on his crazy perch. It took the Queen only five minutes to explain the situation to the military men. I knew there was something like this going on, Your Majesty, the head of the army said. For the last 10 years, we've been getting reports from nearly every country in the world about people disappearing mysteriously at night. We had, the only, we had one only the other day from Panama. For the hatty taste, cried the BFG. And one from Wellington in New Zealand, said the head of the army. For the booty flavor, cried the BFG. What is he talking about, said the head of the Air Force. Work it out for yourself, the Queen said. What time is it, 10 a.m.? In eight hours, those nine bloodthirsty brutes will be galloping off to gobble up another couple of dozen unfortunate wretches. They have to be stopped. We must act fast. We'll bomb the blighters, shouted the head of the Air Force. We'll mow them down with machine guns, cried the head of the army. I do not approve of murder, the queen said. But they are murderers themselves, cried the head of the army. That is no reason why we should follow their example, the queen said. Two wrongs do not make a right. And two rights don't make a left, said the BFG. We must bring them back alive, the Queen said. How? the two military men said together. They're all fifty feet high. They'll knock us down like nine pins. Wait, cried the BFG. Hold your horse flies. Keep your skirts on. I think I has the answer to the maiden's hair. Let him speak, said the Queen. Every afternoon, the BFG said, all these giants is in the land of Naughty. I can't understand a word this fellow says, the head of the army snapped. Why doesn't he speak clearly? He means the land of Nod, Sophie said. It's pretty obvious. Exactly, cried the BFG. Every afternoon, all these nine giants is lying on the ground, snoozling away in a very deep sleep. They is always resting like that before they is gall galloping off to guzzle another helping of human beings. Go on, they said. So what? So what you soldiers has to do is to creep up to the giants while they is still in the land of Naughty and tie their arms and legs with mighty ropes and wonking chains. Brilliant, said the queen. That's all very well, said the head of the army. But how do we get the brutes back here? We can't load 50-foot giants onto trucks. Shoot them on the spot, that's what I say. The BFG looked down from his lofty perch and said, to, this time to the head of the air force, you is having belly boppers, is you not? Is he being rude? asked the head of the Air Force. He means helicopters, Sophie said. Well, then why doesn't he say so? Of course we have helicopters. Wopsy big belly boppers? asked the BFG. Very big ones, the head of the Air Force said proudly. But no helicopter is big enough to get a giant like that inside. You do not put him inside, the BFG said. You sling him underneath the belly of your belly popper and carry him like a portito. Like a what? The head of the Air Force said. Like a torpedo, Sophie said. Could you do that, Air Marshal? Asked the Queen. Well, I suppose we could, the head of the Air Force admitted grudgingly. Then get cracking, the Queen said. You'll need nine helicopters, one for each giant. Where is this place? The Air Force man said to the BFG. I presume you can pinpoint it on a map? Pinpoint? Asked the BFG. Map? I is never hearing of these words before. Is this Air Force bean talking slush bungle? The Air Marshal's face turned the color of a ripe plum. He was not used to being told that he was talking slush bungle. The Queen, with her usual admirable tact and good sense, came to the rescue. BFG, she said, can you tell us more or less where this giant country is? Here's a picture. No, Magister, said the BFG. Not on my Nelly. Then we're jiggered, cried the army general. This is ridiculous, cried the air marshal. You must not be giving up so easy, the BFG said calmly. The first titchy bobstickle you meet and you begin shouting you is biff squiggled. The army general was no more used to being insulted than the air marshal. His face began to swell with fury and his cheeks blew out until they looked like two huge ripe tomatoes. Your majesty, he cried. We are dealing with a lunatic. I want nothing more to do with this ridiculous operation. The queen, who was used to the tantrums of her senior officers, ignored, them, ignored him completely. BFG, she said, would you please tell these rather dim-witted characters exactly what to do? 
A pleasure, Magister, said the BFG. Now listen to me carefully, you two boot bogglers. The military men began to twitch, but they stayed put. I is not having the foggiest idea where giant country is in the world, the BFG said. But I is always able to gallop there. I is galloping forthwards and backwards from giant country every night to blow my dreams into little chiddler's bedrooms. I is knowing the way very well. So all you is having to do is this. Put your nine big belly hoppers into the air and let them follow me. And I is galloping along. How long will the journey take? The queen asked. If we is leaving now, the BFG said, we will be arriving just as the giants is having their afternoon snozzle. Splendid, said the queen. Then turning to the two military men, she said, prepare to leave immediately. The head of the army, who was feeling pretty miffed by the whole business, said, well, that's all very well, your majesty, but what are we going to do with the blighters once we get them back? Don't you worry about that, the queen told him. We'll be ready for them. Hurry up now. Off you go. If it pleases your majesty, Sophie said, I should like to ride with the BFG to keep him company. Where will you sit? asked the queen. In his ear, Sophie said, show them BFG. The BFG got down from his high chair. He picked Sophie up with his fingers. He swiveled his huge right ear until it was parallel with the ground, and then he placed Sophie gently inside it. The heads of the army and the air force stood there goggling. The queen smiled. You really are rather a wonderful giant, she said. Magister, the BFG said, I was wishing to ask a very special thing from you. What is it? The queen asked. Could I please bring back here in the belly poppers all my collections of dreams? They is taking me years and years to collect them. I is not wanting to lose them. Why, of course, the queen said. I wish you a safe journey. Here's a picture of all the helicopters. The BFG had made thousands of journeys to and from giant country over the years, but he had never in his life made one quite like this, with nine huge helicopters roaring along just over his head. He had never before traveled in broad daylight either. He hadn't dared to, but this was different. Now he was doing it for the Queen of England herself, and he was frightened of nobody. As he galloped across the British Isles with the helicopters thundering above him, people stood and gaped and wondered what on earth was going on. They had never seen the likes of it before, and they never would again. Every now and then, the pilots of the helicopters would catch a glimpse of a small girl wearing glasses crouching in the giant's right ear and waving to them. They always waved back. The pilots marveled at the giant's speed and at the way he leapt across wide rivers and over huge houses. But they hadn't seen anything yet. Be careful to hang on tight, the BFG said. We is going fast as a fizzle crump. The BFG changed into his famous top gear, and all at once he began to fly forward as though there were springs in his legs and rockets in his toes. He went skimming over the earth like some magical hop, skip, and jumper, with his feet hardly ever touching the ground. As usual, Sophie had to crouch low in the crevice of his ear to save herself from being swept clean away. The nine pilots in their helicopters suddenly realized they were being left behind. The giant was streaking ahead. They opened their throttles to full speed, and even then they were only just able to keep up. In the leading machine, the head of the Air Force was sitting behind the pilot. He had a world atlas on his knees, and he kept staring first at the atlas and then at the ground below, trying to figure out where they were going. Frantically, he turned the pages of the atlas. Where in the world are we going? he cried. I haven't the foggiest idea, the pilot answered. The Queen's orders were to follow the giant, and that's exactly what I am doing. The pilot was a young Air Force officer with a bushy mustache. He was very proud of his mustache. He also was quite fearless, and he loved adventure. He thought this was a super adventure. It's fun going to new places, he said. New places, shouted the head of the Air Force. What in the blazes do you mean new places? This place we're flying over now isn't in the Atlas, is it? The pilot said, grinning. You're right, it isn't in the Atlas, cried the head of the Air Force. We've flown, flown clear off the last page. I expect that old giant knows where he's going, though, said the young pilot. So an atlas, if you haven't figured out what an atlas is yet, it is a book of maps, so it shows different parts of the world. He's leading us to disaster, cried the head of the Air Force. He was shaking with fear. In the seat behind him sat the head of the army, who was even more terrified. You don't mean to tell me we've gone right out of the atlas, he cried leaning forward to look. That's exactly what I am telling you, cried the Air Force man. Look for yourself. 
Here's the very last map in the whole atlas. We went out off of that over an hour ago. He turned the page. As in all atlases, over, there were two completely blank pages at the very end. So now we must be somewhere around here, he said, putting a finger on one of the blank pages. Where's here? cried the head of the army. The young pilot was still grinning broadly. He said to them, that's why they always put two blank pages at the back of the atlas. They're for new countries. You're meant to fill them in yourself. By the way, that's not true. The head of the Air Force glanced down at the ground below. Just look at this godforsaken desert, he cried. All the trees are dead, and all the rocks are blue. The giant has stopped, the young pilot said. He's waving us down. The pilots throttled back the engines, and all nine helicopters landed safely on the great yellow wasteland. Then, each of them lowered a ramp from its belly. Nine jeeps, one from each helicopter, were driven down the ramps. Each jeep contained six soldiers and a vast quantity of thick rope and heavy chains. I don't see any giants, the head of the army said. The giants is all just out of sight over there, the BFG told him. But if you is taking these sloshbuckling, noisy belly poppers any closer, all the giants is waking up at once, and then pop goes the weasel. So you want us to proceed by jeeps, the head of the army said. Yes, the BFG said. But you must all be very, very hushy quiet. No roaring of motor, motors, no shouting, no mucking about, no piggery joggery. The BFG, with Sophie still in his ear, trotted forward and the jeeps followed close behind. Suddenly, the most dreadful rumbling noise was heard by everyone. The head of the army went pea green in his face. Those are guns, he cried. There's a battle raging somewhere ahead of us. Turn back, the lot of you, let's get out of here. Pigs piffle, said the BFG. Those noises is not guns. Of course they're guns, shouted the head of the army. I'm a military man and I know a gun when I hear one. Turn back. Those is just the giants snortling in their sleep, the BFG said. I is a giant myself and I know a giant snortle when I is hearing one. Are you quite sure? The army man said anxiously. Positive, the BFG said. Proceed cautiously, the army man ordered. They all moved on. Then they saw them. Even at a distance, they were enough to scare the daylights out of the soldiers. But when they got close and saw what the giants really looked like, they began to sweat with fear. Nine fearsome, ugly, half-naked, 50-foot-long brutes lay sprawled over the ground in various grotesque attitudes of sleep, and the sound of their snoring was indeed like gunfire in a battle. The BFG raised a hand. The jeeps all stopped. The soldiers got out. What happens if one of them wakes up? whispered the head of the army, his knees knocking together from fear. If any one of them is waking up, he will gobble you down before you can say knack jife, the BFG answered, grinning hugely. Me is the only one who won't be getting gobbled up, because giants is never eating giants. Me and Sophie is the only safe ones, because I is hiding her if that happens. The head of the army took several paces to the rear. So did the head of the air force. They climbed rather quickly back into their jeep, ready to make a fast getaway if necessary. Go forward, men, the head of the army said. Go forward and do your duty bravely. The soldiers crept forward with their ropes and their chains. All of them were trembling mightily. None dared to speak a word. Notice the BFG with the jeeps in the front and then the giant sleeping. The BFG, with Sophie now sitting on the palm of his hand, stood nearby watching the operation. To give the soldiers their due, they were extremely courageous. There were six well-trained, efficient men working on each giant, and within ten minutes, eight out of the nine giants had been trussed up like chickens and were snoring contentedly. The ninth, who happened to be the flesh lump eater, was causing trouble for the soldiers because he was lying with his right arm tucked underneath his enormous body. It was impossible to tie his wrists and arms together without first getting that arm out from underneath him. Very, very cautiously, the six soldiers who were working on the flesh lump eater began to pull at the huge arm trying to release it. The flesh lump eater opened his tiny piggy black eyes. Which of you foul pastures is wiggling my arm, he bellowed. Is that you, you rotsome man hugger? Suddenly he saw the soldiers. In a flash, he was sitting up. He looked around him. He saw more soldiers. With a roar, he leapt to his feet. 
The soldiers, petrified with fear, froze right where they were. They had no weapons with them. The head of the army put his jeep into reverse. Human beans, the flesh lump eater yelled. What is all you flesh bunking, rotsome, half-baked beans doing in our country? He made a grab at a soldier and swept him up in his hand. I is having early suppers today, he shouted, holding the poor squirming soldier at arm's length and roaring with laughter. Sophie, standing on the palm of the BFG's hand, was watching, horror-struck. Do something, she cried. There he is. Quick, before he eats him! Put that human being down, the BFG shouted. The flesh lump eater turned and stared at the BFG. What is you doing here with all these grotty twiglets? He bellowed. You is making me very suspicious. The BFG made a rush at the flesh lump eater, but the colossal 54-foot giant simply knocked him over with the flick of his free arm. At the same time, Sophie fell off the BFG's palm onto the ground. Her mind was racing. She must do something. She must. She remembered the sapphire brooch the queen had pinned to her chest. She quickly undid it. I is guzzling you nice and slow, the, BF the flesh lump eater was saying to the soldier in his hand. Then I is guzzling ten or twenty more of you midgy little maggots down there. You is not getting away from me because I is galloping fifty times faster than you. Sophie ran up behind the flesh lump eater. She was holding the brooch between her fingers. When she was right up close to the great naked hairy legs, she rammed the three inch long pin of the brooch as hard as she could into the flesh lump eater's right ankle. It went deep into the flesh and stayed there. There she is at the bottom. So a brooch, if you don't know what a brooch is, is a, a decorative piece of jewelry that women t typically would wear on their, like on their collar of their jacket or on their sweater or something. So like often grandparents or people in the older generation might still wear them. The giant gave a roar of pain and jumped high in the air. He dropped the soldier and made a grab for his ankle. The BFG, knowing what a coward the flesh lump eater was, saw his chance. He was bitten by a snake, he shouted. I seed it biting you. It was a frightsome poisonous viper. It was a deadly dangerous windscreen viper. Save our souls, bellowed the flesh lump eater. Sound the crumpets, I is bitten by a septious, venomous windscreen viper. He flopped to the ground and sat there howling his head off and clutching his ankle with both hands. His fingers felt the brooch. The teeth of the deadly viper is still sticking into me, he yelled. I is feeling the teeth sticking, sticking into my anklet. The BFG saw his second chance. Oh, we must be getting those viper's teeth out at once, he cried. Otherwise, you is deader than duck soup. I is helping you. The BFG knelt down beside the flesh lump eater. You must grab your anklet very tight with both of your hands, he ordered. That will stop the poisonous juices from the venomous viper going into your legs and into your heart. The flesh lump eater grabbed his ankle with both of his hands. Now close your eyes and griddle your teeth and look up to heaven and say your prayers while I is taking out the teeth of this venomous viper, said the BFG. The terrified flesh lump eater did exactly as he was told. The BFG signaled for some rope. A soldier rushed it over to him. With both the flesh lump eater's hands gripping his ankle, it was a simple matter for the BFG to tie the ankles and hands together with a tight knot. I is pulling out the frights and viper's teeth, the BFG said as he pulled the knot tight. Do it quickly, shouted the flesh lump eater, before I is pisoned to death. There he is, said the BFG standing up. You can look now. When the flesh lump eater saw that he was trussed up like a turkey, he gave a yell so loud that the heavens trembled. He rolled and he wiggled and he fought and he figgled. He squirmed and he squiggled, but there was not a thing he could do. Well done you, Sophie cried. Well done you, said the BFG, smiling down at the little girl. You is saving all of our lives. Will you please get the brooch back for me, Sophie said. It belongs to the queen. The BFG pulled the beautiful brooch out of the flesh lump eater's ankle. The flesh lump eater howled. The BFG wiped the pin and handed it back to Sophie. Curiously, not one of the eight other snoring giants had woken up during the schmozzle. 
When you is only sleeping one or two hours a day, you is sleeping extra doubly deep, the BFG explained. The head of the army and the air force drove forward once again in their jeep. Her majesty will be very pleased with me, said the head of the army. I shall probably get a medal. What's the next move? Now all, now you is all driving over to my cave to load up my bottles of dreams, said the BFG. We can't waste time with that rubbish, the army general said. It was the queen's order, Sophie said. She was now back in the BFG's hand. So the nine jeeps drove across to the BFG's cave and their great dream loading operation began. There were 50,000 jars in all to be loaded up, more than 5,000 in each jeep, and it took over an hour to finish the job. While the soldiers were loading the dreams, the BFG and Sophie disappeared over the mountains on a mysterious errand. When they came back, the BFG had a sack the size of a small house slung over his shoulder. What's that you've got in there? The head of the army demanded to know. Curiosity is killing the rat, the BFG said, and he turned away from the silly man. When he was sure that all his precious dreams had been safely loaded onto the jeeps, the BFG said, Now he is driving back to the belly poppers and picking up the frightsome giants. The jeeps drove back to the helicopters. The 50,000 dreams were carried carefully, jar by jar, onto the helicopters. The soldiers climbed back on board, but the BFG and Sophie stayed on the ground. Then they all returned to where the nine giants were lying. It was a fine sight to see these great air machines hovering over the trussed up giants. It was an even finer sight to see the giants being woken up by the terrible thundering of the engines overhead. And the finest sight of all was to observe those nine hideous brutes squirming and twisting about on the ground like a mass of mighty snakes as they tried to free themselves from their ropes and chains. I is flush buncled, roared the flesh lump eater. I is split wiggled, yelled the child chewer. I is swag swalloped, bellowed the bone cruncher. I is goose gruggled, howled the man hugger. I is gunzel swiped, shouted the meat dripper. I is fluck gungled screamed the maid masher. I is slop groggled, squawked the gizzard gulper. I is crod squinkled, yelled the, yowled the blood bottler. I is bop muggered, screeched the butcher boy. And here they all are underneath the helicopters. The nine giant carrying helicopters each chose a separate giant and hovered directly over him. Very strong steel housers with hooks on the ends of them were lowered from the front and rear of each helicopter. The BFG quickly secured the hooks to the giant's chains, one hook near the legs and the other near the arms. Then very slowly, the giants were winched up into the air, parallel with the ground. The giants roared and bellowed, but there was nothing they could do. The BFG, with Sophie once more resting comfortably in his ear, set off at a gallop for England. The helicopters all banked around and followed after him. It was an amazing spectacle, those nine helicopters winging through the sky, each with a trussed up 50-foot giant, giant slung underneath. The giants themselves must have found it an interesting experience. They never stopped bellowing, but their howls were drowned out by the noise of the engines. When it began to get dark, the helicopters switched on powerful searchlights and trained them onto the galloping giant so as to keep him in sight. They flew right through the night and arrived in England just as dawn was breaking. Feeding time. While the giants were being captured, a tremendous bustle and hustle was going on, go, going on back at home in England. Every earth digger and mechanical contrivance in the country had been mobilized to dig the colossal hole in which the nine giants were to be permanently imprisoned. 10,000 men and 10,000 machines worked ceaselessly through the night under powerful arc lights, and the massive task was completed only just in time. The hole itself was about twice the size of a football field and five hundred feet deep. The walls were perpendicular and engineers had calculated that there was no way the giants could escape once they were put in. Even if all nine giants were to stand on each other's shoulders, the topmost giant would still be some 50 feet from the top of the hole. The nine giant carrying helicopters hovered over the massive pit. The giants, one by one, were lowered to the floor, but they were still trussed up and now came the tricky business of releasing them from their bonds. Nobody wanted to go down and do this because the moment a giant was freed, he would be sure to turn on the wretched person who had freed him and gobble him up. As usual, the BFG had the answer. I has told you before, he said, giants is never eating giants. 
So I is going down, and I shall untie them myself before you can say Rack Jobinson. With thousands of fascinated spectators, including the Queen, peering down into the pit, the BFG was lowered on a rope. One by one, he released the giants. They stood up, stretched their stiffened limbs, and started leaping about in fury. Uh, before I show you that, I'll show you that that's one of the giants being lowered in. <clears throat> Why is they putting us down here in this grob sledging hole? They shouted at the BFG. Because you is guzzling human beings, the BFG answered. I is always warning you not to do it, and you is never taking the titchiest bit of notice. In that case, the flesh lump eater bellowed, I think we is guzzling you instead. The BFG grabbed the dangling rope and was hoisted out of the pit just in time. The great bulging sack he had brought with him from giant country lay at the top of the pit. What is in there? The queen asked. The BFG put an arm into the sack and pulled out a gigantic black and white striped object the size of a man. Snozcumbers, he cried. This is the repulsant Snozcumber Magister, and that is all we is going to give these disgusted giants from now on. May I taste it? asked the queen. <gasps> don't, Magister, don't, cried the BFG. It is tasting of trog filth and pib squiggle. With that, he tossed the Snozcumber down to the giants below. There's your supper, he shouted. Have a munch on that. He fished out more snozcumbers from the sack and threw them down. The giants below howled and cursed. The BFG laughed. It serves them right, left, and center, he said. What will we feed them when the snozcumbers are all used up, the queen asked. Oh, these never being used up, Magister, the BFG answered, smiling. I is also bringing in this sack a full of... I am also bringing in this sack a whole bungalow snozcumber plants, which I is giving, with your permission, to the royal gardener to put in the soil. Then we is having an everlasting supply of this repulsant food to feed these blood, these thirst blood, thirst bloody giants on. What a clever fellow you are, said the queen. You are not very well educated, but you are really nobody's fool. I can see that. Here's the BFG. <clears throat> the author, and this is the final chapter. Every country in the world that had in the past been visited by the foul man-eating giant set, sent telegrams of congratulations and thanks to the BFG and to Sophie. Kings and presidents and prime ministers and rulers of every kind showed the enormous giant and the little girl with compliments and thank yous, as well as all sorts of medals and presents, or showered them, sorry, not showed. The ruler of India sent the BFG a magnificent elephant, the very thing he had been wishing for all his life. The king of Arabia sent them a camel each. The Lama of Tibet sent them each a Lama. Wellington sent them 100 pairs of wellies. And Panama sent them beautiful hats. The King of Sweden sent them a barrel full of sweet and sour pork. Jersey sent them pullo pullovers. There was no end to the gratitude around the world. The Queen herself gave orders that a special house with tremendous high ceilings and enormous doors should immediately be built in Windsor Great Park next to her own castle for the BFG to live in and a pretty little cottage was put up next door for Sophie. The BFG's house was to have a special dream storing room with hundreds of shelves in it where he could put his beloved bottles. What is more, he was given the title of the Royal Dream Blower. He was allowed to go galloping off to any place in England on any night of the year to blow his splendid fizz wizards, oops, fizz wizards in through the windows to sleeping children, and letters poured into his house by the million from children begging him to pay them a visit. Meanwhile, tourists from all over the globe came flocking to gaze down in wonder at the nine horrendous man-eating giants in the Great Pit. They came especially at feeding time, when the snozcumbers were being thrown down to keep them to, down to them by the keeper, and it was a pleasure. Oops, and it was oh a pleasure to listen to the howls and growls of horror coming up from the pit as the giants began to chew upon the filthiest tasting vegetable on earth. I'm just going to pause for a second. There is the giant's, or the BFG's house, as well as Sophie's little house. You can see it there. <clears throat> there was only one disaster. Three silly men who had drunk too much beer for lunch decided to climb over the high fence surrounding the pit, and of course, they fell in. There were yells of delight from the giants below, followed by the crunching of bones. The head keeper immediately put up a big notice on the fence saying, it is forbidden to feed the giants. And after that, there were more, no more disasters. 
The BFG expressed a wish to learn how to speak English properly, and Sophie herself, who loved him as she would a father, volunteered to give him lessons every day. She even taught him how to spell and to write sentences, and he turned out to be a splendid, intelligent pupil. In his spare time, he read books. He became a tremendous reader. He read all of Charles Dickens, whom he no longer called Doll's Chickens, and all of Shakespeare, and literally thousands of other books. He also started to write essays about his own past life. When Sophie read some of them, she said, These are really good. I think perhaps one day you could become a real writer. Oh, I would love that, cried the BFG. Do you think I could? I know you could, Sophie said. Why don't you start by writing a book about you and me? Very well, the BFG said. I'll give it a try. So he did. He worked hard on it and in the end completed it. Rather shyly, he showed it to the Queen. The Queen read it aloud to her grandchildren. Then the Queen said, I think we ought to get this book printed properly and published so that other children can read it as well. This was arranged, but because the BFG was a very modest giant, he wouldn't put his own name on it. He used somebody else's name instead. But where, you might ask, is this book that the BFG wrote? It's right here. You've just finished reading it. So it's a super clever way for the author, Roald Dahl, to try to convince us that the BFG actually wrote this book when in fact Roald Dahl did. But I liked that little device. That was a cute little way to wrap up the story. I hope you enjoyed it. I think it's a good one. I recommend all of Roald Dahl's books. They're silly and fun and fun, uh, funny. Um, and I also hope you enjoyed doing some of the assignments. So we will talk to you later. Okay, bye.